episode 11. 11? Yes. Double 11? And those for you that are watching in person, I don't know if you can tell, I really amped up my brilliant swag gear. <laughs> we have hoodie available online. Check this out. Yeah. Guess what? T-shirt. I've been wearing these forever. But also stickers mm -hmm. and socks. Brilliant socks. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. I'm I'm like decked out and brilliant today. And how are you doing today? Good. Can't complain. Feel a little under the weather, but it's cold in Vermont. Yeah. Um, I just got back from warm warm weather in mm -hmm. Phoenix, Arizona. What were you up to there? Uh, IFA. And in today's episode, we could talk about networking and conferences mm -hmm. and personal development, self-development. Um, so IFA is a franchising organization that, um, that helps support franchisors, franchisees and with education networking as well um, they have a big role in policy making and or you know helping to shape to shape um, you know working together with politicians to shape certain issues for example right now there is a big issue joint employer issue mm. um, where one of, I, th I think um, certain um, people in the government want to change it so that franchisors are joint employers with the franchisees. And that would really put a lot of liability on franchisors because they're not day to day in the business and they're not the ones really that hire. Or hire the employees of each individual franchise location mm -hmm. um, and you know and that will also disable franchisees as a small business owner you know kind of like doing their own thing because mm -hmm. then you have this joint issue mm -hmm. uh, but hopefully it I wonder will what be started reversed. that was there some sort of thing that popped up or is it I'm not sure I'm not an mm -hmm. expert in it yeah. um, unfortunately there is some people in um, the government that um, don't like franchising you know mm -hmm. uh, it's really unfortunate because mm -hmm. it creates a ton of jobs mm -hmm. it helps regular people become their own business owners and um, helps economy right you know there it's important that franchisors franchise responsibly mm -hmm. and and then maybe there would be less um like fuss about it mm -hmm. and most franchisors uh, do franchise yeah. responsibly but there is a few that doesn't and that's like where these problems come from yeah i know that a while ago we were reading about um franchise franchises that historically have not done well and there was some scams there yeah, was some there was definitely a couple that seemed are, kind yeah. of you know essentially Sketchy. like scams so i wonder if it's kind of the scams and the frauds i mean i, I don't want to name who it was but there was one franchise um i think like the failure rate was like 85 or 90 percent or something yeah like I, i'm even surprised how they were allowed yeah to. so it, that's probably you know unfortunately when things like that happen that's probably where this legislation is coming from yeah so we'll have to monitor it and on the next um podcast we'll we'll give people an update on yeah if couple, any movement on that yeah couple bad apples through in it yeah probably. yeah unfortunately and it's probably um because i know a lot of people use sba money um for, mm -hmm. you know being a franchisee so that might be part of the the legislation as well to protect that money well um mm -hmm. yeah and i mean not just sba people use their own personal money you right. know people can do 100%. different ways to yeah. finance but yeah sba is a good one right for sure yeah. to use and and there were people from sba in the conference representing yeah. from the government um there was a lot of wonderful people in the room. Yeah. 
in the rooms and halls and right, events yeah. and those classes. So very important. Um, I think biggest takeaway what I would like to stress for me is that who you surround yourself, you become. And being around certain things, like we pick up just through osmosis. So if you want to be successful, you want to be around successful people. Mm -hmm. Because um, if you check who you uh, associate with, who you listen to, it's going to be a big determinator of your success. Just like me being in that environment, I just picked up so much new, I, well, not new, but perhaps ideas I kind of heard about before, but they just really kind of, I got it and they stick to, to me. Like being there around people that is doing <clears throat> those things, you know. Um, so I always live by rule, especially in the past like five years that, and actually Jeff Bezos says, said this perfectly, you know, do you want to live life of comfort or do you want to live life of adventure and service? So all, all these people, I felt like they were living life of adventure and service. They were doing um, great things in their communities and they were helping a lot of other people. So that's like my biggest takeaway is uh, you got to keep going to places like this because you can't help but come back inspired to do better, to do more, and also more confident because you see what other people do. And also they share their success and failures. You know, it's not 100% always smooth right. ride. Well, I've been to a lot of conferences as well over the years, mainly geared towards technology. Um, and security, but it's interesting when you go to conferences, you get access to people that you know are quite high up in some of these companies. I remember I was at an HP conference, and um, I believe his name was Partha. He's either the COO or the CEO, and he was just kind of walking around, hanging out, just chit chatting with people. And my colleague and I got to talk to him for probably five minutes. Really nice guy, super down to earth. And um, he introduced us to a couple of the senior engineers that were working on a product that we were deploying. And it was just nice having certain access to uh, people that you would not otherwise have access to. And it's also nice to get out of your comfort zone a little bit, being in a new place, getting new ideas, seeing what other people are doing. And um, I remember another conference, it was technology geared again, but, you know, the, the area that I come from for technology was, you know, maybe a hundredth of the size of this one individual that I was talking with. And it was interesting to hear that, you know, the, the concepts hold true, you know, from a small company, even it's to all a, the same. you know, yeah, to a, a, a it was, a, he worked for a large university, I think in Chicago or something like that. I picked up that same thing, actually. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and. Um, another conference that we went to towards the end of it, um, there was a conference by a bunch of the, the engineers that actually set up the technology for the event. And my colleague and I we were sitting next to each other and we're just like laughing through this whole talk of these two guys, these two high up engineers that set up this event. And we're like, this is a, a multi global billions of dollars of company and they're running into the exact same issues that we do on you know an event that's you know a purchase price of a couple million dollars it was just interesting to hear you know yeah. but what does that tell you it tells you that it takes the same amount of effort to make little money as it does a lot of money it's just a matter of leverage and amount of people mm -hmm. involved, but like concepts are all the same. Yeah, it's it's not uh, rocket science. If you get to like thousand locations versus ten, yes, 
the dif biggest difference will be that you have to have big infrastructure. But guess what? The customer is going to be the same. The product is going to yeah. be the same. Like, it's going to be same problems. So, um, you know, at the end of the yeah. day, there's only kind of one way to make a car, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, there's a combustion engine, tires, wheels, transmission. And that's kind of about it. So, you know, yeah, there's a lot of different car companies out there, but at the end of the day, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. It's not and, kind of, it is. Yeah, and to so talking about the growth of the business and serving more people and, like, scaling and hiring mm -hmm. is um, also my other big, comp well, takeaway. I mean, I knew and lived by this already, but even more is really only gonna be as good and great as the leader as the founder is um destined to be and mm -hmm. and personal development uh because that's the lid like the company can grow bigger than what the vision is of the leaders and the founders you know, because um, HR not not gonna lead and grow your company. You know, like marketing person, yes, they can. They will help you what you want to do. But at the end of the day, like, it's about the vision and the culture. And the culture is very important too. Um, like a lot of people in, um, not a lot, but some people, like I noticed run their franchises differently or at least they talk about them differently let's say you know someone who wants to sell it to pe company and kind of just like profit driven they focus oh like well you know and i've heard this even people that were teaching the classes saying this like profit is number one profit is number one over everything and i i disagree with that well, no, I mean, and clearly there are that's companies wrong. You know, that profit disagree is not with that. number one. And I'll give you a perfect example. You know, Southwest Airlines a year, year and a half ago, when um, essentially they had to cease operations for days because they had run that company in cost cutting mode for years. And, you know, strictly looking at profit. That's the danger of PEs. Yeah. The second yeah. one that I, you know, is, uh, you know, Boeing, look at Boeing and when it merged with McDonnell Douglas and Boeing used to be a staple of American quality engineering and really engineering excellence. And, you know, when Boeing moved from that, that mindset of quality and engineering and you know, producing the best quality product that they could and merged with McDonnell Douglas and essentially a CFO took over and ran the company in cost-cutting mode, you know, look at what has happened to Boeing over the years. You know, a staple of American technology, engineering excellence, is now lost its way, clearly, over the issues that they've had the past few years to companies like Airbus, you know. Yeah. That's what's the danger of running a company in cost cutting mode when it's just you're just looking at profit, profit, profit. And um, that I think for us, for example, our mm -hmm. brand, Brilliant Massage and Skin, I feel like from the very day one when I started the business was the quality and customer satisfaction. And then once I got my first employees, was the employee satisfaction. Right. Because if you create good culture, you, it's like having good foundation on the house. Mm -hmm. You know, if that's not good, it's going to crumble. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and yes, uh, like finding ways how to cut costs, but within reason mm -hmm. and where it doesn't affect the quality or perhaps even improve the quality, like cutting certain roles, adding different roles. Like there's different ways that you can structure, you know. Uh, your business, but the quality, you have to look, look at, is this still going to be good quality? Is the customer mm -hmm. still going to want to come back? Is the people going to want to work yeah. in this company? Like Costco is a great example of good values. And I, yeah. I d well, I mean, Costco, I mean, they're the most reputable retailer in the United States mm -hmm. right now. And the way that they built their company was that 
you know, employees are their most important assets. Yeah, I agree. It's and, such a good way to look at it. You know, at. at Costco, they don't really make money on the products they sell. That's not where the money is really coming from. It's really the membership and all the services. Well, they, That's where yeah. the money is really coming from for Costco. And, you know, they learned when years ago, when they started running that company, that employee turnover is more detrimental than just paying people a little bit more. You know, having people leave and losing that institutional knowledge or constantly dealing with turnover, you know, people recognize that. If there's a company that has... 200% turnover or 300% turnover, you know, people, it's just a revolving door. There's clearly something wrong, whether it's just, you know, issues from the top down or just not filling the right people in the right roles. But it's, it's you know, it's crucial to have the people that are especially interacting with your customers be happy. Yeah, because the f frontline people is is those employees these frontline employees mm -hmm. and some companies forget that they put their lowest paid employee to deal with customers is that really what you want those well, people rep you yeah. know while you have the corporate offices getting bonuses bonuses raises but then you they pay the very bare minimum to right. someone that actually directly talks to your customer yep. that doesn't make sense doesn't yeah it? i mean it's you know going back to what you said about jeff bezos you know it's just kind of this odd dichotomy of him saying you know leaving leading a life of service and adventure when you know his company is has you know some of the most underpaid employees well, I, I don't know specifically of that situation. Mm -hmm. I know that there's been some complaints where they could definitely pay more. Some complaints is a drastic understatement. But, it's clear yeah. that, you know, there is a lot for something like that where, you know, Jeff Bezos to say leave a life of adventure and uh, service is admirable. A excuse me, admirable. Admirable. There we go. Thank you. Um, but it's also, you know, it's a little bit, it reminds me of greenwashing, where, you know, Jeff can afford to pay the workers in his company. But I don't, he doesn't even own Amazon anymore. He, I think it got sold, right? Amazon in general, Walmart in general, you know, these large employers can afford to pay their employees yeah. more. I mean, and the reason yeah. why I say that is, you know, they these could. are publicly traded companies. Their financials, but, yeah. at least the financials that we see, are supposedly legitimate and audited by, you know, one of the big four, typically. Yeah. You know, so it's clear. These companies can pay their employees more. Right, but more. we are, so what our job is to learn from companies that we want to be like and the mm -hmm. ones we don't want to be like. For example, I don't want to be... I mean, God bless McDonald's, they did a phenomenal job, right? But I don't want to have their reputation of being, like, necessarily... I mean, we know the product is not really quality, and now it's not even cheap anymore, you know? Uh, so for us, it's like the quality of the product is number one, mm -hmm. and then the employee happiness, the customer's happiness. Mm -hmm. um, so like it's it's a different generation now too like people that we hire is different than let's say in 2000s in the 90s people used to look at their jobs differently now people really want work life balance work and that's why we are pretty fl pretty flexible at giving people like uh time off when they ask you know they need it for their family their kids right. are sick we're not super strict about that stuff because you know we know we're going to retain them longer because if they have that flexibility, they're not going to be forced to, like, look some other option, other job. Yeah. You yeah. know, I think one thing that COVID really showed a lot of people was, A, how much money they really needed, and B, what they really wanted in life, you know? And I think that some people decided that, okay, maybe, you know, instead of, buying a house or doing this or doing that, you know what, you know, I'm going to rent or, you know, I'm going to do whatever so that I can afford to do this. 
you know, so I think there was a big change, especially after COVID. But yeah, you know, people want this work-life balance. And I think the reason why they want a work-life balance is, you know, take a company like IBM, you know, some of the, you know, are maybe one of the most respected companies in the world up to a certain point. And it was, you know, you started working at IBM, you were going to be there forever. You know, you're going to be a company individual. They were going to take care of you. There was going to be pensions. There was going to be bonuses. There was going to be advancement. You know, they were going to take care of you. And that's not the case anymore. You know, a lot of people look at, okay, hey, you know, I'm giving, you know, my all to this company. And there, you know, there's no pensions. The benefits are maybe okay. Um, but then, you know, as soon as there's a slight dip in the, the share price, you know, they're cutting people left and right. I think people are getting, you know, agitated with that where people are looking for a company that they can believe in the mission of the company, mm -hmm. but also that the company isn't going to, is, is going to take care of them too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and some people with job hop because they know they can get better salary somewhere and that's okay. Um, and now some people aren't, well, now people aren't, workforce is coming back now actually employment rate is the lowest that it's been for a while so people run out of those COVID money now i think too uh, but so the one thing at the conference also um that so helped me to like observing all these different companies and how like okay well our like mission statement is that like make as much profit to our franchisees or may or you know do this and that um and and i it helped me to solidify okay what's our you know biggest priority and statement and what do i want my business to be like you know do i want it to be like McDonald's of massage or do I want it to be like Starbucks or do I want um, Costco uh, type of reputation um, or Chick-fil-A you know like there was I, I was listening talk about Chick-fil-A and Boston market I think they started or Chick-fil-A started a bit earlier than the Boston market mm -hmm. And initially, Boston Market was called like chicken sandwiches or something like mm, that. Uh, so Chick-fil-A grew very gradually, slowly, without taking any investments or selling it to private equity firms. Or uh, they really focused on quality and stable growth and good, great product, where. Um, Boston market, they grew very fast. In one year, they, I think they grew to a billion dollar company and they were opening like 60 units every in every state, pretty almost, mm -hmm. in bigger states. Um, but they had to sacrifice the people they, because if you go with 60, you want to open 60 units in certain area, guess what? You're not going to get all type A locations. You're not going to get all type A players when you're trying to do it so quick. You're going to say, okay, well, this, this like person, this manager is, is like a B or C, you know, but it's okay. We need that number to hit our 60 goal. And then you you yeah. like compromise by not getting the best location, not getting the best manager. And guess what? They went bankrupt. Well, or Chick-fil-A is doing so I well. I think this is kind now. of, you know, to go back to what you originally said with those legislative changes that are, you know, being talked about now is something like what you just described is this growth at all costs. They got too greedy. And you know, who's with a franchise set up, the franchisee is the one kind of holding the bag at the end of the day. And I think that that is potentially where some of this legislation is coming yeah. from is that, you know, you, you, if you're going to be, you know, having a franchise and franchisees and you're going to be, you know, doing it to the spirit of how a franchise should be done, it shouldn't be growth at all costs because the person left holding the bag at the end of the day is not going to be the franchisor. It's going to be I the mean, no, they will be too. I mean, if their franchisees don't do well, their franchise company is going to 
obviously not receive royalties. They're not going to be able to sell more. It's, it's not good for anyone, you know. But the joint employer, the problem with that is that it would disable small business owners, these franchisees, from hiring. I believe it would disable them from hiring their employees. Like franchisor would have to like co-manage that. And that's not what a lot of owners want. They want that independence to be a business owner when they go to franchise, you know. Yeah, they're operating under these rules, but they're still their their own LLC. Mm-hmm. You know, they're they're a small business owner. So I don't know. It's a it's I'm not the best person to tell you about uh, the intricacies of that mm-hmm. issue, but you know that's one thing that I learned at the mm-hmm. IFA. Perhaps people, if someone wants to learn more, you can go to. I can post the link to the franchise mm-hmm. association's website. Um, and if you're interested in franchising, owning your own business, you're tired, you hate your job, contact us. We'll schedule a call with you. And uh, we can show you how to own Brilliant Massage and Skin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's because we actually going to start putting the ads out. Mm-hmm. We have one of our employees is already committed to be a first franchisee, which is super exciting. Mm-hmm. So we can't wait to get that opened up. But we are open in a gradual, you know, we're not going to take on just anyone. It's not like we're selling it to you. We are awarding franchises right. because we want that stable quality growth. So if you think you are you could be a quality operator, you want to have, because that's what the main job of the operator would be. For example, someone buys our franchise. Mm-hmm. We want to focus on customer quality. If you're going to have two star, even three star average, we're probably not going to renew a franchise agreement after those 10 years because you know? right. you've proven you're not a great... Well, you know, it's it's like with any franchise, you know, the franchisee is going to give a bad name for the franchise. You know, going into a poorly run, say, McDonald's and having a really bad experience, while yeah. that might not turn you off from the brand completely... If it's a small brand that's just getting started, you know, word spreads fast, it's a small world. So, you know, having that operator that is really looking for a business to run with that support from the franchise team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of benefits um buying into a franchise because the system's already in place and we and and people get um the support and marketing uh hiring um support we don't hire for you at least not right now depending on as they change those laws but um we we give you templates you know and um location selection you know all these things that are make the business successful because us as the franchisor the most important thing for us is that you are successful. Right. Because well, if you, you don't win. make money, we don't make yeah. money. You want it something to be a relationship that everyone's comfortable with. You know, that there's obviously going to be contention and disagreements. You know, that's just Hopefully life. not too many. But, you know, having something that works for both people. Mutual benefit. It yeah. has to be um, it has to work one for brand, both one people. team. Yep, exactly. And especially for the first few units, that's where you know you really want to, to dig your heels in to make sure that what you're producing is a quality product. Also, the benefit of being uh, buying into a brand mm-hmm. early is that you get to work directly with the founders. Mm-hmm. Uh, once we have. 20th, 30th, 50th location, God willing, we don't know if that will happen, right? That's hopefully one day. Uh, Probably I won't be there as much because, you know, there's only so much time in the day. But right now with our first franchisee, I'm able to go with her, scout location. I'm be there every question she has, you know. On a 50th with those big brands like McDonald's, 
or you're getting the impact. Team, yeah, right? you're getting. You don't not, You're not going to talk to original. You know. Right. Founders. Well, that's just not feasible, and people yeah. understand that. But especially for you know the first few units, that's where you get really a lot of that knowledge transfer coming directly from the founder versus you know a district manager or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, but also just things you know maybe um, you, you know help with things that you know with this individual if if they need some help doing some you know handyman work like. You know, I can help with things like yeah. that. But you know, having those direct access, help. yeah, just direct access to the founders, especially when they're getting started on their franchise journey, and you're getting started in your franchise e journey. That's where you can really the business owner's journey. Yeah, for it's you. it's yeah. that's where the relationship and the 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 can really explode. Yeah, because. Um, I don't want anything more than seeing franchisees be successful, make money, have good reviews on their business, have employees that are happy. That's like number one goal. Right, because well, they're because representing you, you too. Yeah, and if you have that, then you're going to have longevity, you're going to have profit, mm -hmm. you can even leave your business to your kids if they want to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, once it's established, you know, uh, or you could sell it eventually too, um, and get your, in, you know, get your investment back fast. Um, so, it's it's great. It's a great industry, you know. And there's many different concepts that are being franchised. Like home space is pretty big. However, the and food, of course, is big. Mm -hmm. But however, the ser personal services is the fastest growing segment right now, 7% mm -hmm. a year. That's yeah. a lot. Yeah, well, I think, you know, people are, A, leading a healthier lifestyle, which is definitely having a negative impact on, you know, the, the, the brands that are kind of somewhat iconic in the United States, like McDonald's and... Wendy's. And Wendy's, you know. Taco some, Bell. Some and of, even though Taco Bell is right, doing really well. You know, there's obviously these iconic American brands that are doing very well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as America becomes healthier, you know, yeah. look at, you know, the the, the carbonated the beverage smoothie places are doing industry, well you know, or even just, you know, these alcohol that companies are realizing, hey, we need to have a non-alcoholic line exactly. too. Yeah. You know, people are now looking for non-alcoholic options when they go out to eat. And I remember when we were actually in Europe this past summer and we would go to some of these restaurants and if the menu was in English or I could translate it with my phone, you know, it was interesting to see that sometimes there was more non-alcoholic options on the menu than there was actually alcoholic options. Yeah. It was almost the, the, the opposite of the United States. But where I'm going with this is that the reason why I think the health industry and the personal care industry is, is you know, rapidly growing is people are realizing that, hey, I need to live a healthier lifestyle, it's clear. But, you know, I'm going to spend more on things that, you know, are self-care or I can take care of myself or experiences rather than stuff. You know, I, I, I look at it, it's like, you know, how many more pairs of jeans or, you know, clothes or whatever do I need? It's like right. I wear the same, you know, dozen things, you know, all the time. <laughs> or, you know, like Yolita, she wears brilliant t-shirts yeah. and brilliant hoodies. Simplicity. Yeah, me. I mean, I, you know, um, it's colder now, so I have a button-down long sleeve on. But as it gets warmer, you know, I just wear the same. You wear brilliant sweaters. Yeah, I wear brilliant yeah. stuff. But I also wear, you know, my own brand. I T. You know. Yeah, I um, you know, things in the, when it gets a little bit warmer, because I, I like polo shirts, but winter in Vermont is not the best time for polos. Um, but, you know, that's where people are like, well, do I need all this stuff? And I think that was already a catalyst of do I need all this stuff before COVID? And then COVID was really what changed a lot of people's thinking about how and where and what they spend their money on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eating healthier, getting massages, taking care of their skin, exercise. Yeah. Gyms is also another big sector. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, I think people are realizing that they need to take care of themselves because I think maybe there was, you know, like our parents 
age is, well, you know, the company that you work for is going to take care of you. You know, my parents have a pension and, you know, things, and you ask people nowadays what if they're getting a pension, and most people don't even know what that is. But, you know, it's almost thinking that, okay, the company isn't going to take care of you that you've worked for for 30, 40, or whatever years. You know, you need to really be the one taking care of yourself. Invest in yourself yeah, first. Exactly. The same goes for, like, financial success i mean well uh health success you know invest into eating good food mm -hmm. um consuming good uh liquids you know clean water yeah tea, um not drinking alcohol the same for financial success you know you gotta invest like if you hit a certain lead where you can go past certain income level that means you're missing some skill you need to find like what skill are you missing? Is it marketing or is it like you need to maybe change even careers, you know, like mm -hmm. maybe this career you have, this is this is the max you ever gonna make, you know? Maybe you need to start your own business, maybe you need to buy into franchise, uh maybe um maybe it's not the income that the issue, maybe you just don't like what you do, you know. So you need to invest in changing. Or the industry that you're in and where you're physically located just don't mesh well. Right, you know? that too. You know, so you need to never feel bad spending money on education and self-improvement because it does pay back. It does. Before, it, like if you don't have money to invest like much in stocks or add to savings or buy real estate. Maybe first you need to buy books, invest to like learn like what you need to do. Then you do have money to do those other things, to buy businesses or to buy real estate or to buy stocks. Yep. And you know, there's a years ago, I read this book, you know, called the latte Fact. And it was, you know, figure out what your latte factor is. There's this one guy that I know, I've known him for years, and he's going to a local coffee shop literally twice a day for coffee. That's a little bit much. And I'm like, man, like, how much are you spending on coffee? Especially now when it's like day. $7. I day. hope they're giving him a deal because he's such a loyal customer. And, you know, the one time I said it, he kind of had this look on his face like he had never really thought about how much he was spending getting coffee from a coffee well, shop twice a day. maybe he's super rich. I don't think so. Okay. But maybe. <laughs> uh, I've known him for quite but some if time. If you can so. afford it, do it by all means. Yeah. But if you can't, maybe you need to prioritize a little bit. Right. Differently. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's finding, you know, in the book was about your latte factor and it was like, you know, someone that goes to Starbucks every day and spends five bucks or whatever, you know, how much is that over the week? Month, I year. don't do that. But, I'm still like old school. I can't do that mentally. But the thing is, yeah. is, you know, find out and maybe it's smoking cigarettes, maybe it's drinking, maybe it's, it's so going out to the bars, friend. you know, or whatever. Everyone has some sort of latte factor and that's not necessarily, you know, if you like going out and getting a cup of coffee with your buddies, then go out and get a cup of coffee with your buddies. You Life know, for sure. Right. But I think it's, you know, to your latest point where maybe you want to get into investing or you want to try to, you know, buy a business, you know, it all starts with just these little changes where, you know, okay, at first, you know, go out to get coffee every other day or, you know, make coffee, you know, or do something. Um, I think we talked about on another podcast, like I got with, a while ago, got into making chocolate at home. Super easy if anybody's interested. And I will put a link in the comments on how to do it. But it, 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 it's almost like, okay, well, I'm never going to buy chocolate again now because you buy chocolate and it tastes kind of like junk because there's all this stuff in it. Yeah, it, it, there is some good quality chocolates out there, but also they right. cost three times, yep. you know, X. It's just finding, you know, what you can do to start with, that's, you know, low barrier of entry to kind of start thinking about maybe ways that you can save money. Yeah, or like move cooking money at around. home, not yeah. eating out as much. Or trying to manufacture time by doing, you know, things yeah. unless, other times. Unless you made it, you know, and then once, actually, once you get to the point that your time is worth 
like you can make more money in the time that you do like pr make make that coffee you know maybe the people that then uh then it's cost benefit then you know at that point like you don't have to worry about little things like that like you can hire a personal chef at that point you know right. like and when you you're don't at have that to point, say you have you start worrying but less you have to get there first about you know the you, what your latte factor is and more of how to preserve how you got there and is that you know you built a business or you did whatever and it's okay if it's built a business okay how can i reinvest to make sure that my business keeps growing that my employees are yeah, happy not lose that drive too some people right. get complacent yeah. that's the other problem i see yeah i mean look at you know cisco you know a company that was once the bastion of technology and you know switching networking routing equipment really in the world and they got kind of fat cat syndrome yeah and they kind of stopped innovating and That's they bad. kind of lost their way and you know what happened juniper f5 palo alto i mean all these companies came in and gobbled up their market share and then at some point someone at cisco was probably like hey guys this isn't working anymore and it's, I mean, they're kind of on the up and up coming back, but they're never going to be what they used to be, you know? Right. And that's important on a smaller scale, too. Mm -hmm. We as people, that's why I really like that Bezos quote, life of service and adventure versus life of comfort, because growing is never going to be comfortable. It's not supposed to feel comfortable. Like change and innovation is not comfortable. Yep. You're taking risks, you know. Yep. But that what creates that adventure, you know, and that yep. keeps you stuck in this comfort, I'm the best already zone. And remembering how you got there too, you know, for something like a company like Amazon, you know, remembering and understanding and knowing that the employees that you hire should be treated fairly, should be compensated fairly. And yeah, I know there is some things that they need company. to. Yeah, well, there's a lot of companies out there. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure you could bring ten people into this room that have nothing but bad things to say about Costco. But I think there's going to be a lot less people looking poorly on Costco than there is on Amazon. Well, Granted, yeah, there, you know, Costco is not lar as large as Amazon, yeah. but I mean, don't um, don't think that I like approve on everything just because I like Jeff Bezos what mm -hmm. he did. You know, um, yeah, I, there's things I don't like about Amazon, like the Chinese seller, but you know, like the way the structure is set up, for example, to kick out smaller u.s sellers like there's a lot of price wars i mean it's good for a consumer you get yeah. cheaper well, products I mean, but there you know really. it's not never gonna you know. be perfect though you know right. we can't expect perfection but i think what i'm getting to that they keep innovating they keep like even like when they bought the whole foods now you can pay with your palm at whole foods and I did that in Phoenix. It's like amazing. That's the future. You know, that's the innovation mm -hmm. that they keep doing and investing into innovation like that. Yeah. If anybody's listening from some countries overseas, you're probably like, wow, welcome to 15 years ago. <laughs> I know. With that. But, you know, Each for me, that was the first time here that yeah. I paid with the palm. Yeah, I remember the first time I went overseas. I know to, China really has a lot of Yeah, that. I was in Asia, and it was the first time I went to, to Asia, and I mean, this was probably 15, almost 20 years ago at this point. And you would walk up to a soda machine, and you would text the soda machine from your phone. And this was even before texting was even really like a thing in the United States. And I remember asking one of my colleagues, I was like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm buying, like, we're going to get some snacks. I was like, so you text the soda machine and then like snacks come out? And he's like, yeah, it just goes onto your like mobile phone bill at the end of the month and you just pay it. And I came back to the United That's States cool. and you're like, quarters. anybody at quarters? Like, yeah. and then I don't even know when like, you know, they got enabled so you could do like Apple Pay or Tap or, or whatever. But, you know, some of these things, 
you know, are not necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, you know, each country has its own. Yeah. I mean, U.S. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. And U.S. It's still, I think it's still on the forefront of innovation. Yeah, for certain things, um, for sure. Electric cars, like this Waymo taxi also that I saw in Phoenix, self-driving taxi was pretty cool technology. And when you see, I mean, China does um, copy us a lot on different things. Like a lot of stuff does come out first mm-hmm. in the U.S. But somehow in the U.S. We, it doesn't get implemented throughout the whole country. I feel like there are pockets of areas where it's like, okay, this innovation was made here, but then somehow it ends up in China being produced, you know, and then, like, we don't cost. really have it here that much. Yeah, it's, so. you know, it's, yeah, it's expensive it's, to do business in the United States, and, you know, the, the government is trying to change that with bringing, you know, chip manufacturing back to the United yeah, States. Yeah, and they should fix up the immigration system, too. And there's some issues with some people... Uh, like right now, it seems like the homeless population have increased where perhaps these people could be rehabilitated and the, or prevented before they become homeless. Like there could be more done to, because, you know, if that's going to keep happening, our um, output, like economic output in the world scale, that's like gets impacted too, you know. So in order to stay on top of the game, I think really we need to also look at our schools and education and culture here yeah. too. Yeah, I mean, just, you know, there's people that graduate high school and have no idea what a lease is or how basic finances work, you know, sometimes it's a little, a little concerning. But, they could teach that stuff at yeah. school more. But I guess yeah. that's like a talk for another yeah. day. Yeah, so I think we need to to wrap up. So if there was one, what's the, I think you already said, and I think I might know it is, but what's the one five-second takeaway from the conference before we wrap up? Invest in yourself first. Yeah. Education, knowledge, that's what separates successful from unsuccessful, willingness mm-hmm. to learn and change. Yep. Change is hard, but when you pivot to the what's going on around you, you're able to act fast, not afraid to take some risk. Mm-hmm. You're going to win at the end of the day. You might lose a little couple battles, yep. but if you don't try, you, you lost already. If you don't yeah. try, you don't educate yourself, you're not doing anything. Yes, you're not taking risk, but also you're not yeah. going to win. You don't just, buy that lottery ticket, you're never going to win. Yeah, just taking that first step, and I don't know if I'd say buying a lottery ticket. <laughs> yeah, don't, I'm not, that's, that's a just a... Uh, buy a lottery you know, ticket for fun, you know. Yeah, that's a, how does that word, um, like, um, example... Yeah, but, you it's, know, I think... I'm not saying one, that literally go yeah, and buy it. I buy think, it in a... Theoretic, like, um, yeah, the one thing that I kind of look at it, you know, to what you just said is like, you know, for me, I like to cycle, and sometimes it's just, you know, the only thing you can do is just keep pedaling, keep moving forward, you know, try something if it doesn't work. Don't get stuck in the comfort zone. Try to maybe, you know, modify it a little bit or, you know, try a different approach. Even with exercise, it's uncomfortable, but it makes you stronger. Yeah. The same with taking action. It might be uncomfortable, but then you kind of build up that stamina and that tougher skin where yeah. those things don't affect you as much yeah. anymore. Yeah. Practice cool. makes perfect. Yeah, well, I think we're... Thank you for listening. Yeah. Thank you for that was tuning a good, in. Uh, yeah, episode 11. So we'll be back a couple of weeks maybe, maybe a month. Who knows? Usually we've been doing it once a month, but we yeah. might do it sooner perhaps. Yeah. So um, maybe we'll come... F- back uh, from a surprise location as the weather gets perhaps yeah stay right. tuned we'll have the live uh, studio audience here share, like. us out, so. if you want to be a guest we might take on some guests in the future hit us up mm. we'll chat so, together yeah. mm. have a brilliant day Bye-bye.